Okay, everyone, hello. Welcome to our webinar. Um, today, we are uh, presenting the first in a three-part series. And um, I wanted to uh, introduce myself. I'm Jill Escher. I am president of the National Council on Severe Autism. And I am here uh, to um, introduce this series. We have part one today, which is on medical support for severe and challenging behaviors. Part two is next month, and it features four of the um, most illustrious and uh, most knowledgeable experts on insurance for autism um, in the country. That is May 27th. And then on June 24th, uh, we are going to be turning to behavior, behavioral and sensory support to address severe and challenging behaviors. So you can go on our website under webinars and sign up for them. They are free. And then we have webinars throughout 2021. Um, everyone is on mute. Um, and uh, this webinar is being recorded. It will be posted um, afterwards on our website, ncsautism.org. Um, throughout, you are free, feel free to pitch questions to our speakers um, via the Q&A function. We probably will not be monitoring chat. We're also going to try to push this webinar you know, fast enough so that we can reserve time at the end so that the panelists can respond as a group um, to people's individual questions. Um, your hosts today are Don Turnage, Stephen Pretzman, and Jennifer Penhale. And with that, I am going to turn it over to your host, um, Don Turnage. Welcome, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Our first speaker today is Dr. Carmen Lopez, and she is the Medical Director of Psychiatric Mental Health at Kennedy Krieger Institute. Dr. Lopez, thank you for joining us today. Thank you very much for having me. So let me just share my screen so we can go ahead and start. There you go. So um, I'm going to talk to you today about challenging behaviors in autism uh, definition, but also medications that we use um, in psychiatry, neurology, and developmental pediatrics to address some of this. Um, important to notice that challenging behaviors even though are present in autism, we see it in other uh, uh, um, presentations uh, of genetic disorders or intellectual disability. It is not exclusive to autism. Um, I am, the, as I said, the medical director of a psychiatry mental health program, and we have some regular you know, psychiatric care for, for children, but we also focus a lot on developmental disabilities. And I have a million titles there, but the one that matters to me is, is the psychiatric care and my neurodevelopmental consultation clinic. Faculty disclosures, I have grant funding from the governor's office of crime control and prevention in Maryland and, and no other. Um, like I was saying, what matters the most to me of all these things is the neuro neurodevelopmental consultation clinic which is um, the way that I can, I think, be of most value to other professionals. I consult to others that have kids uh, that have challenging behaviors and help them manage their care from afar. So my goal is to evaluate and educate. What I usually see are kids that come with, you know, behavior problem, which I don't know what that means. And, and it's important to to identify details of a behavior issue. Um, then my job is to determine, is this a challenging behavior or not? What is with the normal expected for whatever the clinical presentation or context of an individual is? What is, is it pathological or not? And what is next and what do I do with this behavior? So we need to start with the definition of challenging behavior. And, and you know we see that, um, all over the place. And it is very important to clarify exactly what it means. It's a culturally abnormal behavior of such intensity, frequency, or duration that the physical safety of the person or others is placed in serious jeopardy or behavior which is likely to seriously limit or deny access to the use of ordinary community facilities. That's the bottom line intensity, frequency, duration that impairs, limits, or denies access to community. 
change here. Oops. The challenging behaviors come in, very, in a many different uh, categories, but it, it is important to always ask details. We talk, we hear about non-compliance with directives, repetitive behaviors, restricted interests, sleep problems, mood instability and emotional meltdowns is a very common one, aggression and self-injurious behavior. And whenever I ask about this, I'm very specific. I think it's so important to, to name things adequately. And the, one of the most common mistakes I hear about in parents and other providers is, oh, the patient's aggressive. Hold on, what do you mean? Yelling, screaming, or doing this is not aggression. And it's so important to qualify and identify exactly what is the behavior problem you want to, to explore. And then the other part, does it interfere with quality of life? Yes, if it limits safety and limits access to everything. That it bothers you, that it's annoying, that it's too loud. That's not a challenging behavior. That's a you problem. What I'm talking is about the patient issue. Does it interfere with their quality of life? And you know what I'm talking about today, forget about the rest of the slide, just about the curve. The patients that I see most often in my consultation clinic are the ones that fall into this range. Um, you know, they're, they're usually a, a component of intellectual disability on it, but not all the time. Dr. Lopez, I'm yes. sorry, this is Jill. You yes. aren't, from what I can tell, you aren't full screen. So, oh. it's, so it's a little hard to read your, these slides. I don't know if it's possible to change the presentation mode. Uh, I'm so sorry. What do you mean full screen? Ooh. You're seeing my, both? Yes. Oh. <laughs> you know, that's exactly what I was not trying to do. I apologize. <laughs> it's uh, no big me, deal. It just would be clearer. I, I apologize. Let me just go back. And, okay. uh, so there you go. Is that it? Let's see. Yes. I, I apologize. I'm so okay. sorry. No worries. Um, so ignore the labels. I, I just, what I was saying here is that focus on the drawing. That's what I, this is the people I'm talking about that I see more often in my consultation clinic. And these are uh, some of the cases that I'm going to talk to you about in a second. Uh, challenging behaviors are often not always a reaction to the environment that services that services or other fam or other people create around people with developmental disabilities the demands of school the demands of stores and sometimes families and the most common cause of the challenging behaviors that i see are communication difficulties that certainly complicate this situation um, before talking about anything about how do you treat challenging behaviors we need to ask why are they there and you know, one of the these are these are like this, the most common cases I get in my clinic. You know, referred by a pediatrician or by you know the neurologist. Ten-year-old kid with ASD, hearing and vision impairment, non-ambulatory, and severe to profound ID due to a genetic syndrome. And the chief complaint I get is she's disruptive in class and not able to participate in learning. I hear that all the time, and it's just like it doesn't mean anything to me. Let's explore more. Well, what does exactly what does she do? Well, she flip flops just like a fish out of the water on the floor, smiling and looking up to the ceiling. When does this happen? In class during circle time. And what do you do? We talk to her and it just blows my mind. I mean, she can't hear you. What are you talking about? So, you know, the environment is certainly a big issue here. You know, we know that people with um, visual impairments it's often that they look at the light. It's, it's a common kind of, I don't want to say stereotypic behavior, but it's, it's common. Um, we have a kid that doesn't have input through the hearing, input to visual, so her, she's not ambulatory, so her input, it's all in movement. That's what she does. She's sensory seeking input by flopping. Um, so, you know, we have to be so aware about what are the expectations of somebody in, an, in a developmental level this kid, her developmental level, she was 10, so her developmental level was about seven months old. So expectations need to match where the individual is. You cannot expect things that are not going to be matching the person. Um, okay, so what was my intervention? Well, is she disruptive to whom? To you, she's having a great time at flip-flopping and getting all the sensory input. In this case, there is a, a certain kind of personnel in the schools that is called an intervener that works with blind students. Once this patient got an intervener at school, 
everything changed because she had more one-on-one -on -one attention and more, you know, they do certain things by touch to be able to decrease the extensive sensory seeking. So, you know, this was a great case. I love that, that improvement in this child. 12-year-old, um, seizure disorder, intellectual disability, um, static encephalopathy of unknown origin, and autistic spectrum disorder. He was seen at the emergency room for swollen face from self-punching. And this is also very common, and it just boils my blood. The ER told mom, well, this is normal because, you know, he's disabled. So it's fine. Send home. Um, I saw him later, oops, um, you know, by, by as a referral from his pediatrician. I'm sorry, I'm missing it. Okay, here. Uh, I saw him at the request of his primary care. And my first question is like the most normal question that I could think of. Did anybody check his mouth? And of course they didn't. And he had an, a dental abscess. So communication, pain, and the importance of not dismissing and assuming that because somebody is disabled, that explains everything. It doesn't. And you know, I don't have to tell the audience that. You know that. Third case, 10-year-old, average cognitive functioning, and ASD. Family is going to the amusement park for Halloween. The kid refuses to get in the car, throws the shoes at mom, and screams, and it's a big to-do, and everybody's upset in the house. Well, you ask more questions, and you know this is so common here in Maryland. Um, it's October, October in Six Flags. Oops, I said the name. They do something called Monster Fest, and people are dressed up as monsters. They approach you. They're loud and they're scary. You're ten. They jump all over the place. Siblings are older. They all want to ride the roller coasters. I get it. I don't want to go either. Why would she want to go? So I think it's important, again, and, and this is the, the slide that was messed up, I apologize, about environment, noise, lights, excessive amount of people. And really, this is an issue of communication. I do not want to go there and you're making me. So I'm going to react in a way that I'm communicating with you that I don't want to get in the car. Um, case number four. 10-year-old, ASD, head slapping, crying, reduced toy play, decreased talking, hiding under the chair at home and at school, laying in bed, loss of appetite. And here is where things change. This is not the common of a challenging behavior, but this is change in behavior that represents something that it's different. And this is where psychiatric disorders come in. There's a lot of comorbidity in kids with developmental disabilities. And I apologize, I, I say kids because that's what I do. I see children, but you know, in individuals with intellectual disabilities and autistic spectrum disorder or anything that involves brain function, we have a higher incidence of comorbidities or mental health problems, same thing. Depression, anxiety, mood disorders, psychosis, trauma, sleep disorders, they're not exempt of sharing this. The opposite, you have a higher risk of having it. We see that co-occurring conditions in ASD, we see depression affecting two, two to 30%, ADHD affecting 29 to 83, OCD 1.8 to 81, the, the, the variability is great. Anxiety disorders 2.9 to 35, it's so variable. But the real question is, is it because not all of them are diagnosed and you see so much variability? Are people being assigned a disruptive behavior or a behavioral problem? instead of exploring a little more details about a challenging behavior that it's presenting and what is behind it. The first cases were very easy. You could, see, well, to me, you can see that, you know, there's some kind of explanation and some kind of things that you can have an effect and, and change the surroundings, the environment, or address the physical pain to change it. However, when you have a comorbidity, things are very different. Um, we have now the DSM-5 and, you know, depending on intellectual functioning, the presence of the symptoms or the diagnosis, facilitating the diagnosis of a psychiatric disorder can be a little bit more difficult. Um, DSM-4, let me, DSM-5 is not exactly great. DSM-4, you know, it was just like terrible for, for us, but we have something else 
in between, which is very interesting. The DSM ID four, it's behind the current times, but it's better than nothing. And the DSM ID, it's precisely the Diagnostic Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders and Individual with Intellectual Disabilities. So now that we have DSM-5, the, the DSM ID-4, it's behind the times. Both our man manuals are diagnostic guides and are not set in stone. Patients are people, and we do not read the manual to have symptoms. And you know what was very clear is when we had DSM-4, remember you couldn't have ADHD and ASD. I'm like, you know, reading the DSM-4, it's like, well, tell that to this kid because he didn't read it. Um, so it's very clear that we have ways to go. And this is just a guide. There's so much work to be done and there's so much research to be obtained. So learning, it's still a process. Now, what do we do with these challenging behaviors? They happen all the time. As I said, some of them are part of the psychiatric comorbidities, but some are not. How, how do you treat them? And the first step on addressing them is to find out the possible causes of such behaviors. Um, there are no recipes. You know, many, much, many of the treatment that we do in psychopharmacology is extrapolated from current research in individuals that are not intellectually disabled or do not have autistic spectrum disorder. Plan A should always be non-pharmacological options if possible. And that's in capital letters because it's if possible. But certainly psychopharmacology should not be the first choice to address challenging behaviors. They can be a very effective second choice. We should always avoid monotherapy, meaning medication only. It should always be in combination treatment with behavioral therapy, with parent training, with any other options that are available to us. Um, I'm sorry, let's skip that. And you know, is it okay for my child to use psychopharmacological agents? Always ask, what is the side effect profile? What are the risks? What are the benefits? What are the indications? What, are, what is the age that this medication is used for? There's a big bunch of medications. And what I'm going to do is just to give you a very fast glance at all the things we use. They have different indications. People use them off label sometimes. And it is very important that whenever your child or, or, or you are recommended a medication, you know, this actually should be, we should be educated consumers. What is this for? How will I know it works? And what are the adverse effects of this? Um, the first and most common use medications are the ones that are for ADHD. There's just two, two, two ways of, two flavors, stimulants and non-stimulants. And in the stimulants, again, there's two big flavors, the methylphenidate family and the amphetamine family. All of them have different brand names. It's immediate release, extended release, combination of immediate with extended, doesn't matter. So all of them are just these two families. All the presentations have to do with duration and with formulation. It can be a tablet, a capsule, a liquid. And one of the important things actually that drives the decision-making on any medication besides side effects or whatever are two other things that are not necessarily you know, um, great. One of them is insurance coverage. It's a fight to get something that you want and it's not on your formulary. And the second one is the formulation of the dosage presentation. You know, does your child, can they swallow a pill? Can they, you know, if you crush it, they're going to say, oh, it tastes funny. I'm not taking it. Will they take liquid? So those kinds of things sometimes drive the decision making of what to use. And then we have the, the non-stimulant atomoxetine, Stratera, um, that it's also used uh, as ADHD management. Um, antidepressants, there's, a, and I, it was antidepressants and anxiety medications. And I put this group first because it's the one that I use most commonly for children. Uh, there are called the SSRIs, Selective Serotonin Reuptake Inhibitors. You can see the generic names. You can see the brand names. And here's where the trick comes. You know, which ones are FDA approved for children and for what? So we have only four of them that are approved for children. And, um, you know, the indications can be depression, anxiety, or OCD, like Lubox. Um, it is important to... to as a physician, I always know the presentations about what's liquid, what's not liquid, because it's important to decide and helps you 
work on, on your planning. So an example of this, and you should always ask about this when you prescribe something. So like sertraline, sertraline, it comes in liquid too. So you can start very little and go very slowly. Other medications like, uh, like escitalopram, Lexapro, it comes in like big chunk of tablets. So you have, you can only do like 10, 20 and, and it makes it a little bit more complicated. And then others like uh, fluoxetine, it comes in liquid and it comes in capsules. And, but the capsules are 20, 40 and there's a tablet that it's a 10. So you have to make a lot of run around combinations to try to get the doses you want and make sure that the insurance will agree to pay for this in combinations on the plan. Of these medications, I use all of them. The one that I'm always wary about is the paroxetine, just because kids get, you know, stomach virus, they throw up, I'm not eating today. And paroxetine, you can feel it if you stop taking it abruptly. So I don't love that one. Um, other categories, dopamine reuptake inhibitors, norepinephrine and DR. I, which uh, we also use a lot, um, serotonin, norepinephrine, reuptake inhibitors, SNRIs. Now, of those, I don't use the except the venlafaxine. The other three, um, they're not approving children, and you know they're newer. They do work. I, I'm, I don't doubt it. However, you know it's these medications are readily available and are great. They're FDA approved. They're cheaper and they're effective. So. I don't go to the next step unless I actually need to do that. Um, other antidepressants that you will see around are, you know, tracetone. Tracetone is a very interesting antidepressant because we don't use it as an antidepressant. You need very high doses to reach an antidepressant effect. So you will see these very often prescribed for sleep because it's a great, uh, it's a great sleep aid. Um, Mirtazapine, a Remeron, it's also a great medication to use. And this is, important as well when we pick what to use. This medication happens to increase as a side effect, appetite and sedation. So kids that have trouble eating or sleeping and you give it at night, you're using the adverse effects of the medication to your advantage. So those are the kind of tricks of the trade that, that we use to determine which medication to pick. And then you have the tricyclic antidepressants. I do not use that in children uh, with ASD or any intellectual disabilities or actually any children. Uh, this is something that you will see used a lot in adult psychiatry. Um, other agents, super common, alpha-2 adrenergic agonists, wanfacine and clonidine. You have the uh, trademark um, of Intuniv and Cabe for extended release. We use these medications all the time for kids with ADHD that are younger or for sleep or for irritability. Usually none on its own, but in combinations with others, um, they're mostly safe. And we take advantage of the adverse effects, meaning sedation, especially with clonidine for sleep. Um, about smooth stabilizers. This is also an interesting group because all mood stabilizers are, well, 99.1% of the mood stabilizers are anti-epileptic agents. So we have the valproic acid, you know, lamotrigine, neurontin, carbamazepine, oscarbamazepine, and topiramate. Um, interestingly enough, many of our kids have also other comorbidities, health comorbidities like seizure disorder. So sometimes it works for both. And sometimes when we use them, um, we use a smooth stabilizer usually, valproic acid, valproate, lamotrigine, and topiramate. Um, again, the, some of these require blood work levels, you know, blood levels and monitoring of metabolic profile. About this group, not all anti seizure medications have mood stabilizer properties. And, you know, this is a, a constant issue and conversation that I have with my neurology colleagues. Please don't use sonogram, it just messes up the behavior of my people. It, it is, it's very interesting to see it happen. Many times when me as a psychiatrist prescribe a medication, people are wary of side effects. However, if they see a neurologist and they prescribe the same medication, the questions are different. Um, it's just an observation. So Sonogram definitely is not a mood stabilizer, even though it is an anti-seizure medication. And then the other mood stabilizer that is not an anti-seizure medication, exactly the opposite of Sonogram is lithium. And lithium, it's a fabulous mood stabilizer. Um, 
but it requires uh, blood work and close monitoring. Then you'll see the antipsychotics. There's a lot of them. However, remembering that only two of them are FDA approved kids with autistic disorder, which is the risperdone and the abilify. Um, and it's also important to, to, I'm gonna repeat that because it is approved for targeting irritability. And I have seen people that prescribe antipsychotics, especially risperdone in kids that have autistic disorder just because they have autistic disorder. That is not okay. That is not correct. And it should, you know, it will not affect the core symptoms of autism, uh, but I have seen it. So that's why my consultation clinic, it's very important to advise and educate other professionals. Um, how do you pick others? So of this list, um, I mean, we do use uh, risperdone, uh, risperdone and, and uh, um, aripiprazole all the time, but one of the adverse effects, especially of the risperdone is the metabolic side effects and the weight gain. So it is important to know all of the antipsychotics to know which others to use. Um, now I have to tell you that there are two of these lists that I do not use. One of them is the onlancepine. Why? Because sometimes people get in the inpatient unit for any reason and they get started on onlancepine and it works great. And the kid goes home. When you're in a control environment, would they serve you your food? It's great. The moment you're out and the olanzapine increases your appetite, it's horrible because then the weight gain goes sky high and we have to get rid of it. The other one that I do not use is clozapine. Clozapine is a great medication. It's, it's very good. However, it requires a lot of control and you have to be part of a registry to use it. Uh, that is used very much so with uh, adults with schizophrenia. And it's great, it's a great medication, but we do not use it in kids. Um, and then other options are to pick here, it depends on the presentation, you know, like risperdone, risperdone comes in liquid, comes in, in uh, uh, you know, dissolving tablets, same as Safris, and Abilify comes in liquid too. So it's uh, how can I get this medication in that is going to be workable for the family, that the patient's going to be able to get it in, and that will give me the least amount of side effects. Dr. Lopez? Um, yes. Dr. Lopez, it's done. We have two minutes left. Yeah, you I'm done. Yeah, I'm almost done. About gene site genetic testing and whether or not you recommend that. So, you know, if you were telling me that you're going to get this testing and everything is going to be fine because we're going to follow what they say and you're going to um, mortgage your house to get it because it's a priority, I'm going to say don't. When it first came out, I did use it some. It really didn't give me much information that was useful to me. So um, if you want to get it, you can. Is it helpful? In my personal opinion, it is not, but that's something that you should also ask to the other two presenters and see what's their opinion. And this is my last slide uh, because, and, and this, I wanna make, up, make sure I mention this, benzodiazepines, we use them, especially in individuals that have, you know, comorbid catatonia with it. However, I will discourage you forever to use medications like alprazolam, which is Xanax, or any of the others just to, in, in a regular basis, just to chill people out. Benzodiazepines will chill anyone out, including me. And that doesn't mean it's going to address the reason why I'm having challenging behaviors. You will get dependent and you will be chasing the dose because you will get used to it. And then we're stuck. Um, especially in children, you cannot stop it abruptly because you will have withdrawal symptoms, including seizures. And then, you know, what's used for what, how it is decided and what's the data. And that's the next talk. That's my last slide. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, uh, we have time for one more question um, before we move to our next speaker. Don, did you want to ask another one? Yes, I have one more question in the chat. Uh, can you talk about THC for teens with severe autism and intellectual disability? So, you know, and, and this is a, an interesting question because in Maryland, we cannot get it. However, if everything is a risk benefit and everything, it depends on quality of life. 
if you are going to tell me that it, that you're going to be taking it and you're going to be doing neurosurgery tomorrow morning, I'm going to say no. If you're going to tell me this is for somebody that has severe challenging behaviors that put some them at risk of somebody else and interferes with living with their family, I would say I would do it if I was you. I think Dr. Hendren's going to touch on um, yes. THC, I think, in his presentation. So, um, so everybody asking questions, just be aware we're really going to try to save this time at the end to really go through a lot of your, your individual questions. Um, but let's turn it over to Stephen, our next host. Stephen, take it away. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Thank you, Dr. Lopez. Lopez, by the way. Thank you. That was wonderful. Thank you. Um, uh, Dr. Uh, Robert Hendren is a professor of psychiatry and behavioral science, Division of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry and director of the program for research on neurodevelopmental and translational outcomes, PRONTO. And Dr. Henry is past president of the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry and is chair of the board of Oak Hill School in San Anselmo, California. He has published over 150 scientific papers and five books and has been listed in the best doctors in America each year since it was first published in 1996. And on a personal note, he is my 20 year old son's psychiatrist and has been for many, many years. He's held our hands on countless occasions when we're trying to um, figure out how to make my kid feel good in his own skin. Um, and he's also uh, donated countless hundreds of hours to Oak Hill to do just that, looking for that needle in the haystack to help our students out there. Um, so thank you, Dr. Hendren, for being here, and I'll pass it to you. Thanks for that warm introduction, Steve. It's really been nice to be part of your family um, and uh, to feel like we're all working together. Um, I. Uh, We'll be talking today about psychopharmacologic treatment and a little bit about complementary and integrative medicine. We have 30 minutes. I hope that I'm gonna do this in 20 to 25. We'll have a brief time for some discussion, but some of the questions might be fun for all three of us to talk about uh, at the end during our open discussion time, which should be about a half an hour. Some of my psychopharm talk uh, is going to be redundant with what you've already heard. I guess we got our signals a little mixed because I thought I was talking about psychopharm, but Dr. Um, Dr. Carmen gave a great talk um, that covered a lot of things about psychopharm. And I think these will overlap in ways that you'll find interesting. So I have a few different research grants that support some of the work that I do. I'm on advisory boards. I'm not gonna promote any of these products, but some of the products I'll mention as we go through. Uh, what I hope to do is what I just said, review some of the um, uh, complementary and integrative treatments, but also some of the psychopharm treatments, and then describe the ones that I think have greater detail. When people say, what causes autism? We know that there is a genetic component, that there is a strongly genetic component, but genes don't explain all of how autism comes about. We wouldn't be seeing so much more autism if it was just a genetic disorder. There seems to be a way that genes interact with the environment to create that disorder. And that says in ways, maybe there are things we can do environmentally that improve the outcome. When we don't do that, and we somehow feel that um, this isn't a hopeful disorder, which I, I'm afraid we did a, gener a few generations ago, it puts kids in places where they can't get access to the best kinds of environmental uh, things that, that improve their outcomes. And, um, and then restricted development happens and then the outcome becomes even worse. Um, as I thought about this, I was, uh, my, some of you know my wife is French and uh, our daughter was living in France and got engaged to a 
French guy and he lives in Alsace. And we went there to visit his family and they said, would you like to go to some wineries? And I said, gee, that'd be great. And you might recall Alsace Lorraine was carved out when a glacier came down through that part of France and, and kind of mixed up the soil in a certain way by carving that valley. And each of the wineries would talk about their terroir saying that's what makes Alsatian wine so great. And they said it's, it's the mixture of sand and clay and lava and other things, but it's not just that. It's also the amount of rainfall and the amount of sunshine, but it's not just that. They said it's also the souls of the people tilling the soil that give our cepage, our grapes, this great terroir. And I thought as I listened, well, you know, that's the way kids grow healthy brains. In some ways, if this is a slice through the center of the earth, we could say the core of that is the DNA, but the whole story isn't there. Or we could look at the symptoms on the surface of the earth, but the whole story isn't there either. It's what's happening in between in this end of phenotype. And it's the ways that we can affect the way genes express themselves, the way that there are physiologic processes or neuromodulators that we can affect in brain structure and function as well. When I was first coming up with this diagram, I was giving the talk when I was still at the Mind Institute and said to Sally Rogers, you know, part of the, the problem is you're behavioral treatments like the early start Denver model are just working on the surface of the earth. And Sally looked at me and she said, you know, Bob, you're wrong. If I get these kids young enough, and if I get them and, and could match the right treatment, I can re-sculpt their neurons. I can change the way their brain is growing. And that's why I put those arrows that go all the way through that the things that we do, we shouldn't do in just one place we should try and do them in all the places so that we're treating the whole body and trying to help the whole body be as resilient and as healthy as is possible. And that we shouldn't do it with just one thing, we should do it by effect or approaching all the levels. So on the surface level, but as Sally points out, reaching down much deeper, there are behavioral interventions or family support or structure in their lives. And the next level might be speech and language, OT therapy, CBT. The next level might be pharmacotherapy. The next might be biomedical and epigenetic. And then in a kind of an extreme way that I don't know that we're totally ready for yet is thinking about gene modification. And what I'm gonna talk about primarily today are these levels two and three. The first has to do, and, and, and so I'm gonna talk about a number of, of disorders that we see that are frequently comorbid or in some ways considered part of autism for at least some kids. And Dr. Lopez talked about that before, but we see clinically significant symptoms of ADHD, and this is a broad range, 16 to 60%. But that averages out to be about 40% if we're talking about across all populations. It might be rarer in some and more common in others, but it's frequently comorbid. And it used to be that the DSM said we couldn't make both diagnoses. We couldn't diagnose autism and ADHD together. But DSM-5 said, no, we can do that. We can do the two together. They frequently co-occur. And we find that when ADHD and autism co-occur, that there is often a greater impairment in adaptive function and in health quality of life for those that have both than those that have one or the other. And if we're talking just about autism, we're talking about then those kids that have ADHD symptoms and those that don't. We look at stimulants, the, the evidence for the effectiveness is mixed. Um, there's uh, as was pointed out in the previous talk, there's methylphenidate and there's dextroamphetamine. We have a little less evidence for dextroamphetamine, but many of us still use them frequently, both of them. And probably child psychiatrists use them um, amphetamines a little more 
than methylphenidate in part because somebody's already tried a methylphenidate type medication um, early on and it didn't work or had bad side effects. So early studies where they titrated the dose up fast or involved younger children showed it didn't work as well, but a rough study came and showed that it actually did show improvement, but not as much as just straight ADHD. And I find lots of parents will come in and say, you know, I've wondered about ADHD, but we tried stimulant medication with our child when he or she was young and they did horribly. You know, they seemed almost psychotic. They couldn't sleep. They were way too stimulated by those stimulant medications. We find as kids get older, they come to a point where maybe they could that could be considered again and they do better as their brains have matured. So for parents that are saying, no, no, never give me that one again, at least when they get older, I try to say, let's give it a try, but let's start at a very low dose and work our way up slowly. A related medication that was mentioned in the last talk too is atomoxetine. It works on a little different neurotransmitter system and in a little different part of the brain, but seems to help some kids with autism and ADHD together that didn't do well on just stimulant medications. So it's worth considering and in thinking about treating ADHD, I encourage parents to say, we're gonna, this might be a little bit of educated trial and error. We may need to try two or three things or maybe even more to find just the right one, but that might include starting with stimulants and then going to atomoxetine but it might include going to the other medications that were mentioned before, like clonidine and guanfacine that work on a little different neurotransmitter system, may not be quite as good for distractible inattention, but help with anxiety and with impulsivity and hyperactivity. So there are a few studies, none very recent, but a few studies suggesting this works well for kids that uh, are on the spectrum and have ADHD as well and are worth considering, usually not as a frontline treatment, but as a certain second treatment or in combination. Sometimes we use these two in combination with stimulant medications and find that they both have different effects. They work in different ways and can be helpful by having them together. I saw one of the questions in the box that we'll discuss when all three of us are on, but said, what about using multiple medications? And you might've seen a recent study that said, the majority of children with autism who are taking medication are taking three or more medications. So you say, well, how does that work? We used to somehow think, no, no, we never wanna use more than one medication. I think one has to be cautious and how each one is introduced and not introduce all of them at one time or go up gradually on each dose, but try and maximize one. But often another can have a different effect and can be actually complementary to what's being done and work differently. If we had a medication that combined all three of those in one pill, then maybe people would say, okay, I feel better about that. But in truth, we'd like to somehow find the right combination for each child. So it helps to have somebody who's knowledgeable, helps to have parents and other caregivers be good observers, and then try to think about how do we get the right balance for each child. Another challenge that we face with kids with autism is one of the core features, which is restricted and repetitive behaviors kids that get stuck, kids that have trouble with transitions, kids that get uh, going over things over and over and over again. And the truth of the matter is we don't have a really good medication for that. There was a recent review that reviewed other reviews saying that when we do meta-analyses and look at all of the things used to treat restricted and repetitive behaviors, we don't have anything that works really great in terms of medications. Behavioral treatments work, but their effect size, which we call how much improvement do you really see, is not really great either. 
but sometimes the combination of those can make a difference. And there was an editorial that I wrote this year that you can see referred to that talks a little about that and how we make decisions, and how we think about those things as we move along. Depression is another that has been mentioned and is sometimes overlooked in children with autism. They don't come and say, I'm feeling depressed usually, but you can sense their irritability. And especially as they get into adolescence, they can increasingly get depressed as they begin to feel that they're not fitting in in the way that other adolescents might be or that they're worried about what their life is going to be like. And we often overlook it as well with females who are more quiet about it, and that these depressive symptoms might uh, appear with females that we don't hear about, but we hear it, we, we recognize it increasingly with males that are start in adolescence and go into young adulthood. And it's led to another under-recognized thing that we have, which is a suicide risk in kids with autism. People sometimes just don't think that kids with autism could also be suicidal, but is that especially during that time when that depression happens in adolescence and they can feel discouraged and lonely and the social support may not be as available as it was when they were younger, then there's a greater risk. And this one study in Taiwan found an increased risk of suicide attempts for kids with autism compared to all other adolescents and young adults. So it's worth considering. It's not common and it's not something that people should have to just be constantly worried about, but it's not something that should be overlooked if a kid says, oh, I want to die. You may feel, well, they're being dramatic and they may be but it's worth asking more and thinking about whether there's a plan and maybe having somebody else step in and think about it also. And antidepressants can sometimes be helpful in this case. They're not as helpful for the restrictive repetitive behaviors, but some. And the ones that we use the most commonly for all young people are SSRIs. And serotonin is cons consistently shown to be dysregulated in autism, but, and, and some of the SSRIs have shown some improvement, but the, the study that really kind of set the stage was a double-blind placebo-controlled trial looking at kids with repetitive behaviors where the active citalopram didn't separate from the placebo and made people recognize that maybe SSRIs aren't our full answer for these repetitive behaviors, but they can be really helpful in depression and worth considering. We know that kids with autism can be psychotic. We didn't used to think that, but as we've reviewed charts and seen cases, we've seen kids that can at times get psychotic. My experience is they don't often stay psychotic for a long period of time. In adolescence, at a high risk time or young adulthood, they may develop psychotic type thoughts. And then I've thought, oh my gosh, I missed the diagnosis. It wasn't really autism, it was something like schizophrenia or bipolar. But as they get older, it tends to get a little better. So these are not distinct tracks, and it may be that they come up. And studies in other countries, and increasing studies here say that there is that risk for psychotic and bipolar disorder does overlap with autism and would benefit from treatments for psychotic disorder or for bipolar disorder. The one that kind of is increasing in its recognition for kids with on the spectrum is uh, disruptive mood dysregulation symptoms. DD, uh, DMDD, Disruptive Mood Dysregulation Disorder. And these are kids that have severe temper outbursts at least three times a week, that they can be sad and irritable and angry almost every day. The reaction's bigger than expected. The child must be at least six. The symptoms should begin before 10. And they're present for at least a year. The child has trouble functioning in more than one place. And sometimes this is where we combine stimulants, antipsychotics, 
and mood stabilizers. So all of those can, can sometimes be useful in helping these things get stabilized. For antipsychotics in the last talk they were mentioned, there, these studies, if you look at the dates, were from a while ago, but they were studies that uh, have been the seminal studies in looking at both risperidone and an aripiprazole that have shown that they can benefit for irritability for kids that have autism. So a summary of the meds, and then we're gonna do about five minutes on uh, integrative medicine, is that stimulants work for some, start low and go slow. Antidepressants may be good for anxiety, for OCD and, and autism has been less clearly beneficial. Alpha adrenergic agonists work uh, and it's worth a try for anxiety. Anticonvulsants can be helpful, especially for mood dysregulation. Antipsychotics, we have an indication from the FDA for risperidone and for aripiprazole, but there are other meds that we wind up using at times like acenapine, and there's been a negative lorisidone or Latuda study, the one or one of the two that seemed to not have as much um, uh, weight gain, but sometimes causes inner restlessness. And that study was negative for lorisidone. So for five minutes, I'm gonna talk a bit about complementary and integrative medicine. And uh, I know people were asking in the box before about whether the slides are available. You're welcome to my slides. You could either get them through the people that sponsored this talk, Jill Escher or the others in the organization, or I can find some way to send them to you. But I know there, this is a brief, fast talk, and I hope that we can get more in depth when we get into the next section for discussion. You know, I, I think as we start thinking about integrative medicine and as we start thinking about the way that we can help the body be more resilient, we're kind of having a paradigm shift. We've had that in other areas of medicine where we look at um, uh, people with cardiac disorders or with cancer or vascular disorders and we're thinking about treating things like oxidative stress or immune function or inflammatory disorders. But increasingly, we're thinking about doing that for autism as well, because we're finding that all of those things seem to have good evidence for occurring in autism. Mitochondrial dysfunction, uh, my, the microbiome, a variety of those are all things that can be targets for our treatments. Usually the treatments don't show huge effect sizes. They don't show great big changes. But over time, they show a steady kind of change. And they can be used in conjunction with psychotropic medications, but it doesn't have to be one or the other. So we began to recognize this when we see people with autism have intestinal inflammation, digestive enzyme abnormalities, metabolic impairments, oxidative stress, mitochondrial dysfunction, immune problems. And that improvement in these symptoms can be achieved by a combination of nutritional recommendations, prescription meds, addressing the underlying medical conditions, and thinking about supplements that might help with some of those processes that aren't going so well. This is usually like a two hour talk. And so I'm gonna give you the quick summary and you can look at these slides later if you'd like, but if we start to look at immune function, melatonin seems to have an effect for that. And melatonin is helpful for sleep and studies have shown that it is. The rest of the things here don't have great evidence. Doesn't mean they don't work, just means there's not great evidence. For mitochondrial function, insufficient evidence again for those three, but the one used most commonly is CoQ10. And some parents say, it's been helpful to my kids. And there's one study showing a modest effect uh, from CoQ10. Oxidative stress, we did a study of injectable methyl B12, showed two, actually two studies showing benefits from that. And those have been published, but still grade B evidence because it hasn't been replicated. Same for NAC, that people have shown benefit from N-acetylcysteine, especially for 
um, uh, repetitive behaviors or self-injurious behaviors. Not too much in neurotransmitters. GABA or baclofen showed a negative study. Bimetanide is a diuretic and it's been studied a fair amount in France. There's been a randomized control multi-site trial going on in this country and other places that hasn't been released yet, but was thought to be helpful enough that it seemed worth a try. And the glutamate, we don't have fully anything that seems to show clear benefit. Lots of vitamins thought to be helpful, still with insufficient evidence to show that they should be used routinely. But as I've said, because there isn't evidence doesn't mean they're not effective. Probiotics, grade B evidence, pancreatic digestive enzymes showing some benefit. And even now the fecal transplant that hasn't been published enough or studied enough, but again, showing some benefits. I'm nearly on my last slide. And uh, medical marijuana, you know, it's a tough one. Uh, in California, we've had legal marijuana for a long time, but even before it was legal, parents could get it if a doctor wrote it. And I'd have parents that would come and after we've tried all we could think of and the child was still really anxious or not sleeping or being aggressive, um, they'd say, would you write for medical marijuana? And I would, and they'd go to a dispensary and they'd, uh, the dispensary would want to talk to me. And often there was kind of 60s music in the background. And I could imagine this guy in a tie dye t-shirt kind of giving people advice on how to use this. And we've come a ways since then. We're just starting a trial right now for CBD from a company in Great Britain, multi-site trial uh, using CBD oil. Uh, there is another trial in a related way that a major uh, pharmaceutical company is doing. And we're hopeful that that's gonna lead us to where we know doses, we know side effects, we can get a pure product, which we don't fully know right now. But I have a number of families that have tried CBD, sometimes in combination with THC and report modest benefits often in conjunction with other treatments. Acupuncture, another one that might be showing some benefits. So my final slide is when I first did the methyl B12 study, I was a bit of a skeptic. I had just become the executive director at the Mind Institute. The parents said, we want you to leave no stone unturned, do good science, but keep an open mind. I asked people that were integrative medicine people, what should I try first? And they first said chelation. I said, no, I don't want to do that. Then they said methyl B12. The second kid that came in, it was as though he was seeing me for the first time. He looked at me in a way that the veil had been lifted. And it, it, may, it was moving to me to see that maybe there are ways that we could help these kids that are underneath this veil. I think parents know that kid underneath the veil. Sometimes people only see the autism. And I'm not saying that they're totally separate, but there is a way that some of this oxidative stress or immune function or other things can be improved. And we can improve things with medications as well. But I think it's important that we try to treat on all levels. So I think I have one minute left, right? Uh, yes, thank you, uh, Dr. Henry. Do you have, we have uh, maybe one question, if that's okay. Um, sure. Uh, just, and we have a half an hour at the end, I think, when we can come. Great. We can. Um, and and uh, folks, uh, uh, just so you know, there's a, there are a couple of videos on YouTube where Dr. Hendren uh, is able to get into a little bit more depth on all of this. Uh, for you to check out. So just take one question here from Alicia, and it's uh, the first question. Sorry, there's a lot a lot of questions, but um, hopefully we'll get to some of those uh, at the end. Um, Alicia writes, uh, is it okay to use THC to treat self-injurious behavior if the person also has a seizure disorder? Um, I usually encourage people to start off with CBD and then start adding in a bit of THC. The THC, as you know, is the, the part that, that uh, is, causes people to get high. So I think CBD 
is a good place to start, but I found the dispensaries can keep adding more and more THC. As you know, um, they're marketing now CBD, sometimes with a little THC as a medication that treats seizure disorder. So for the most part, we found it fine to use those two together and it's not a, an issue. Wonderful. And I, um, well, thank you so much, Dr. Andrew. And we're gonna pass it on now to Jennifer. Um, are you there? Great. I am. Okay, so good morning and good afternoon. Our next guest speaker is Dr. Lee Elizabeth Wachtel. She's the medical director of the Neurobehavioral Unit at the Kennedy Krieger Institute in Baltimore, Maryland. She's done incredible research into the severe and challenging behaviors that present in both children and adults with autism. She has case studies and expertise to share. Dr. Wachtel, thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. Welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for inviting me. I'm just gonna try and share my screen. I'm just gonna try and share my screen the right way because it, I was able to do it before, but now it doesn't seem to be cooperating. Uh, let's see. It's sharing. Okay, it's sharing. And is it sharing in the full screen view? It is. Great. Okay. Hooray. I'm not so great on the technology, so I'm glad that that's working. Okay, awesome. Well, um, thank you again for inviting me to join you. Um, I'm going to talk today about um, what might actually be two um, terms that don't necessarily seem to go together. I'm not going to go um, really into depth about what, what ABA is from a PhD perspective, but talk about it more from the MD perspective. Um, and as somebody um, who works in tandem with ABA experts um, in addressing severe challenging behaviors in individuals with autism and intellectual disability. And then I am also going to talk about the uses of electroconvulsive therapy for um, intractable psychiatric and behavioral presentations in autism. Okay, uh, let me just make this smaller. All right, well, so I think like as, for those of us who are parents of children with autism and definitely for those of us taking care of these individuals, you learn pretty quickly that pills are not always a magic bullet. And um, even though there are, uh, you know, if you think from a, a, a real bullet perspective, there are many different bullets that might be available to accomplish many different jobs. Um, unfortunately, in the world of autism, swallowable, in quotation marks, bullets um, don't always work, despite the really vast variety of options that are often available. And of course, it's important to keep in mind that not all conditions really can be treated with medication and a response to medication is really going to be limited to whether or not somebody actually has a drug responsive condition. Um, some conditions shouldn't be treated with medication and medication in many times with our patients often confers only a partial benefit. And then unfortunately, individuals with autism and intellectual disability are at a significantly higher risk of adverse side effects and kind of what I call strange and idiosyncratic reactions to psychotropics that usually you only read about in textbooks, but in this population you see all the time and those side effects can actually become extremely limiting. Um, I do like wordsmithing, I admit to that, but one of my um, kind of favorite expressions is that psychotropics for challenging behaviors in autism need to be used judiciously and parsimoniously. Um, this is actually like really in my work on the neural behavioral unit, and I started here um, right after graduating from residency, I learned that this is truly like a, a paradigm shift for a physician. As a physician, you're taught like, oh, I should prescribe some medications. I should use what I've learned about medications and try them out because that's what I'm here to do. And um, unfortunately, um, the um, field of applied behavioral analysis is always not usually taught to medical students, residents, or physicians of any sort. Um, I've also found in the autism and intellectual disability, disability world, there's oftentimes a schism um, between people who with expertise in ABA and psychopharmacology or more of the biological aspects of developmental disability and a lot of kind of turf wars, if you will, or people feeling as if like their cheese has been moved and it's difficult for those disciplines to work together. 
Um, but actually, um, what I found so have found so important about incorporating the ABA perspective into psychiatric care is that a lot of these principles make like a huge amount of sense once you actually have heard about them, even though they're not necessarily something the MD is trained to or necessarily supposed to be doing. I like to tell this quote. So um, one of the senior administrators across the street had asked me about challenging behaviors related to a lot of children who present in the Hopkins ER. And you know, his um, his question for me was like, you know, why do these children behave these behave this way? And you know, I gave him our classic example of you know the kid who sees cake on the table and he wants some more. He doesn't know how to communicate for it, and so he whacks himself in the head. And so this administrator was like an MD internal medicine guy, was just like completely perplexed about that and said like, you know, he really like loves cake, but like, frankly, it would never have occurred to him to like hit himself in the head to um, access cake. And I was like, well, welcome to our world because that happens all the time with these patients. Um, it's really important to keep in mind the limitations of psychotropic trials for challenging behaviors in ASD. We're all very like research focused and appreciate all the research and time that goes into that. But one of the things that I think is um, a pitfall is that in these types of trials, behaviors are really accepted like at face value. So if a child is reported to have self-injury, aggression, agitation, irritability, disruptive behaviors, destructive behaviors, there it's very rare to find a situation where those study subjects have actually been separated out by their function of their behaviors. And that really matters as compared to just accepting the behavior at face value, because you end up in a situation where, to me, it's kind of like comparing apples, oranges, bananas, and like just tossing up the whole fruit salad um, up in the air. If you have children who are engaging in quote unquote behaviors, but some of them might have biological function to that. Some of them might have operant function to that. Some of them might have medical function to that. And if you're not able to separate those out, then um, you end up in a very strange situation where I kind of use the image of various fruits and then morphing into a, um, into a mushroom and then just being extremely confused and frustrated. Because many times I think that these drug trials without separating out, separating kids out by function of behaviors, may be attempting to target something that isn't drug responsive at all. And so therefore doesn't necessarily always give us the best information about um, medication utility. And I always warn people about the knee jerk reaction of, um, when you hear kind of in the same sentence or the same chief complaint from a family behaviors and autism to automatically assume that um, because Risperdone and Abilify have FDA approval for first line interventions, that that's necessarily the right thing to pursue. Um, it may be the correct thing to pursue, but the question that needs to precede that is why is the ch child engaging in those challenging behaviors? Without even beginning to answer that question, you really are not able to um, to fully and kind of comprehensively provide treatment. Um, just a tiny bit of like overview of ABA, and I'll know you get a lot this in a lot more depth next month. Um, I uh, highlighted what I think are two really important things to keep in mind that you know, research in ABA has demonstrated that between 60 to 70 percent of challenging behaviors can, are associated with a socially mediated function. The most common of those, of course, are access to attention. And remember that doesn't have to be like high quality, loving and snuggling time. Sometimes just telling your child to knock it off or that's really horrible or stop doing that, you're driving me nuts is all the attention they need. Escape from demands and um, access to tangibles. When I started here, tangibles would have been um, food and uh, food and television. Um, food has remained... Uh, <laughs> a very um, important uh, act, a tangible to access, TV tends to have been replaced by iPads. Okay, the other thing to keep in mind though is that in um, the remainder of cases, there is not a social function to behaviors or a social function that can be identified. And so you see here, the kind of the separation between the, the environmentally maintained the social function and then the biological. But then what I, what I wasn't really sure how visually to represent, um, but if you can imagine kind of a shading in the middle, many times these overlap and make the situation more complex. Um, and then that's up to the, then we find ourselves as clinicians starting to separate those things out.
Okay. So, you, you know, lots of people talk about traditional functional analysis and, you know, the actual like gold standard functional analysis, of course, is like very like objectively driven with like almost like laboratory type of like setups, requires a lot of time, requires a lot of energy, very expensive, very difficult to access and probably not um, readily available to everybody. Okay, so we'll get back a little bit back to that. But what's important about behavioral assessment and the findings, whether they're gold standard or not, is the wide range of treatment interventions that actually can be pursued. And I just you know, listed like some of the most common ones that we see here um, in terms of skill building, a manipulation of antecedent and um, and uh, subsequent components, extinction, um, differential enforcement of various types, token economies, level programs. So what's important about that? Um, as psychiatrists or MDs, we might not be actually implementing those, but right off the bat, you see there's, there's like a huge number of options here, a huge number of highly valuable options that have no physical side effects other than, and not to downplay this, but the wear and tear on the care provider who has to implement them. Behavioral interventions don't require laboratory monitoring. They don't require EKG monitoring. They're free. For the right indication, they really, really work and can be an extremely valuable component of the child's treatment protocol um, and work hand in hand with biological interventions. And so kind of my, um, my last uh, emphasis on that is that um, if you happen to hit your head to access cake, risperidone is, um, uh, really not going to help you actually and probably make the, the situation a whole lot worse because it's going to make you very hungry for cake and make you really want the cake um, if you weren't so inclined before. Okay, so just I'd like to keep in mind and remind people that so the gold standard isn't always available and that's okay because in the same way that you know autism exists as a spectrum, ABA work and this type of these types of interventions exist along a spectrum as well um, in terms of community options, more of a functional behavioral assessment rather than a formal functional analysis. And even in working with the MD psychiatrist, neurologist or pediatrician, developmentalist, many of these things, these functional relations can be explored to help make better decisions about biological targets. Um, of course, one of the most recent challenges to behavioral assessment and treatment is that uh, I think most of us on this webinar know that severe autism and challenging behaviors are certainly not in vogue in, 200, in 2021. Um, many people um, unfortunately object to the modification of behaviors, um, which are the ugly but very, very real face of autism. Um, and, you know, we're always kind of like walking a fine line. This article is often referred to um, within the ABA community. Um, you know, the kind of the funny like subtitle is the right of people with developmental disabilities to eat too many donuts and take a nap. And, you know, referring to how like you and I are typically developing people, we could eat donuts all day or sleep all day. And, you know, we have the, the civil right to do that as American citizens. So why shouldn't our patients be able um, to do the same without, of course, any consideration of the consequences of that? I was very disturbed last month, I just had to throw this in here, to um, attend a um, lecture sponsored by a very prominent university where I was informed that the usage of the term severe autism is a microaggression, challenging behaviors are a private occurrence in a child's life, and the parent does not have the right to discuss them with care providers or anyone else, and the parent should actually work on reframing these behaviors in a positive light and not think about the negative. Uh, well, that is my opinion on that matter. And I would also ask if your child has like grade four cancer, if you should try to reframe that in a positive way too. Okay. Um, so now getting into the second part of the talk, I'm going to completely switch gears. Um, and you'll probably think like ECT, ABA, these are like at way other ends of the spectrum. And I will admit that it's taken a huge amount of time to be able to bring ABA specialists on board with um, electroconvulsive therapy. But so what happens when psychopharm and ABA are not enough? Well, what happens is similar to what happens when typically developing individuals with severe psychiatric disturbance do not respond to things that you can swallow. And relief can be found for the right indication with what is the oldest, most powerful, misunderstood and maligned agent in the psychiatric armamentarium. I just threw in there a historical picture of an ECT device from that's probably dates back to like the 40s and um, a modern ECT device. Okay, so you know, why is ECT so important? And well, 
if you look at the history of, and this is actually of convulsive therapy because Maduna did not use electricity, he used pentylene tetrazole, but in convulsive therapy, the, even the earliest patients were among the sickest. Um, these are quotations from um, clinic notes from these first patients treated in 1934 Budapest, catatonic patient who hadn't uh, been in a stupor for four years, didn't move, didn't eat, didn't take care of himself and had to be tube fed, was injected with um, camphor and oil in 1934. Two days after his fifth injection, he got out of bed. He began to talk, requested breakfast, and was interested in everything around him. If you think this doesn't happen in children or only happens in 1934 or um, decades ago, um, you should really think again, especially in autism and intellectual disability. And so, you know, ECT with autism, the kind of the new frontier for ECT has largely been linked to the diagnosis of catatonia. This is a historical image of Carl Kabam, who in 1874 um, coined the term catatonia um, as a clinical presentation of psychiatric illness, um, putting together vocal, motor, and affective symptoms into one disease entity, um, currently recognized as a freestanding syndrome. You just see some various um, historical images of um, catatonic patients. The DSM-5 um, diagnosis of catatonia is a big improvement from the DSM-4-TR in that um, we're now able to make a, DS a catatonia diagnosis independent of other diagnoses and rather than just being a specifier of schizophrenia, affective disorder, or um, a general medical condition, um, which is really important, especially in our patient population. Um, these are the 12 symptoms of catatonia recognized within the DSM, and I have starred as number eight and nine, the psychomotor agitated symptoms that can be readily seen in catatonia and that are often of high relevance for our patient population when we're talking about um, uh, challenging behaviors, both aggression and self-injury. Okay, well, so there's actually been a lot of work done on catatonia and autism. There have been four studies looking at the incidence of catatonia in autistic individuals. The first one was 21 years ago, um, finding that 17% of those patients, uh, children and adolescents, met criteria for catatonia. Um, also led to um, what are known as the Wing Shaw catatonia criteria, focusing on slowness, a motivation, and prompt dependence, which are often the first things of which parents complain. A study five years later in Sweden found a somewhat lower incidence of catatonia in autism, but interestingly started to bring into this bring um, into the question this issue of challenging behaviors, finding that 50% of individuals in this sample engaged in SIB, nearly a fifth engaged in um, aggressive behaviors, and nearly a quarter had motor disturbance in the form of tics. This is a study from University of Michigan. Probably one of the most important findings was the delay in diagnosis in that um, except for two patients, no study subjects had been correctly identified during the course of treatment. This was a retrospective study. And um, this study from the UK four years ago um, actually places the incidence of catatonia somewhat higher, near 20%, and um, was a study looking at um, a kind of a, a wider range of catatonic behaviors, or what the British call attenuated behaviors. Okay, if you open up like the large DSM, not the handbook, the DSM has done like, a huge, made a huge contribution in recognizing the two sides of the catatonia diagnosis and reminding us as psychiatrists that in catatonia, individuals may engage in very severe self-injurious and aggressive behaviors. And in addition to the risks of the medical risk of a catatonia that's untreated, may also suffer from significant comorbidity from self-inflicted injury. I always remind people to think of both sides of the catatonia coin. It's not just sitting like a lump on a log. You could see that, but you can see the flip side of this frenetic agitation associated with horrendous um, self-injurious and aggressive behaviors. So treatment of catatonia, um, as bad as kind of it sounds, is actually kind of cool because it's very simple and involves the usage of benzodiazepines in increasing dosages and ECT as necessary if benzodiazepines are insufficient or clinical situation demands more immediate and robust treatment response. Um, Probably avoidance of prejudice and misconceptions is one of the most important things to keep in mind in treatment of catatonia. Um, and also what we've learned is that long-term treatment is critical 
just like medications that may be used for challenging behaviors, if ECT is helpful, um, it is not going to cure the problem. It will treat the problem. And unfortunately, is not like amoxicillin that you can swallow twice a day for 10 days and be finished. So just to flesh out a little bit more of the self-injury link, this has really been a very exciting innovation in terms of the recognition of repetitive self-injurious behavior um, that has no operant function, devoid of operant function, demonstrated in functional analysis to have no operant function as part of a movement disorder um, and, and part of the agitated catatonia spectrum, opening up ECT as an option for people who had otherwise exhausted every other, every other choice. Since it's a webinar, like I have so many patient photos, but with the risk of a making someone making a screenshot, I will use um, historical images. These are images from late 1800s France, a catatonic patient, and you see the range of you know being stuck and not moving, and then also engaging in self-injury. This article had measurements of the patient's self-injurious um, wounds. Um, this is another image um, from history of a catatonic patient who actually died of malnutrition and severe negativism and had mutilated himself um, before he died. And this is again the, the range of catatonic behaviors um, that you can see with this patient's um, face blocked out. Okay, um, kind of just like a side note in terms of catatonia, you know, we wonder is catatonia is it catatonia alone or is it associated with something? So catatonia can be a standalone diagnosis, should always be approached alone acutely because acute recognition and treatment saves lives. However, and very relevant for our patient population, the most common etiologies of catatonia are affective illness and psychotic illness. And that being said, as we heard from the previous presenters, individuals with autism and intellectual disability have a higher incidence of all forms of DSM psychopathology. It's been estimated since the studies, the Sir Michael Rutter studies in the 1970s that people with intellectual disability have three to four times baseline rates of um, psychiatric illness. And there is extensive literature on this and something that about which you should always kind of have your eyes peeled. I just throw in this slide. This is a slide comparing the core and CUC multi-site studies of um, ECT e efficacy in adult major depression. I draw your attention to what I circled in orange in terms of the response or remission rate for major depression. And um, the, the CUC use right unilateral, core use bilateral. Um, whether you're looking at right unilateral or bilateral, you look at those circled numbers and see numbers that are a lot higher than any other drug than any drug on the market. So I will um, complete with a case that I'd just like to review. And again, I apologize, I don't have photos or videos. Um, this was an 11 year old youngster who experienced a significant catatonic regression, and was with us about two years ago, um, withdrawn, lost all um, interest in engaging activities, stopped eating, um, more or less just stayed in his bed under the covers. He um, engaged in a lot of um, different posturing. Mom described it as like freeze walking and would get stuck, had frozen faces, um, unusual posturing of his head and his torso and engaged in intensive, extensive, and nonstop SIV. By the time he reached us, he'd had ear hematomas, multiple head wounds, traumatic cataract development, and needed to have um, artificial lenses placed, placed. He'd also detached both of his retinas and blinded himself in both eyes, which is a really unfortunate outcome of this type of behavior. So, before he went to ECT, he, we did conduct a functional behavioral assessment. No surprise, his head directed SIB had no operant function. However, his aggressive behavior and his body directed SIB did have operant function, which would become very important um, once he was acutely treated. This is a tabular depiction of ECT response. And I guess it's like a busy slide, maybe hard to um, see clearly on like a computer screen. But important things to point out here are the um, reductions with um, ECT, of course, but also the reductions with behavioral treatment even before ECT was implemented and the uh, combined or synergistic reductions with treatment and ECT with behavioral treatment and ECT. And then after this young man was treated and remitted in terms of his mood and catatonic symptoms, we did a lot of additional behavioral work because he also had operant functions to his other behaviors. Extensive behavioral work was, under, was undertook over the course of several weeks. 
and with a very complicated um, behavioral protocol um, developed that actually worked because now the biological part had been addressed. So we can then address the things that had nothing to do with biology, like you no know, wanting to have snacks and not wanting to transition from higher preferred to lesser preferred items or activities. Um, we, ABA has helped us significantly in terms of being able to wean and reduce the use of arm splints. Parent training was, was pursued um, because none of this works unless parents are able to do it outside of a contrived inpatient setting. We generalized his entire treatment package off the unit. And you know, I should point out all these things just to emphasize the, the team model and how um, two seemingly like disparate uh, disciplines work together for patient result. Okay, so conclusion, there can be some very complex treatment refractory behavioral presentations in autism that really defy our standard wisdom. Drugs play a role, but are not necessarily like magic bullets or panaceas. The world of applied behavioral analysis and operant function should be apparent to psychiatrists and other um, individual MDs working with this patient population. Electroconvulsive therapy can offer re relief when medication fails, but even ECT, um, in as much as um, it really is magic in a box or a true game changer, as um, one parent told me, it's not. It's often not the only thing that's necessary. And just to end with some words of wisdom, so this is the Marquis de Condorcet, who just reminded us that we would do more things if we knew less of the impossible. Thank you very much. Now I will try to figure out how to make this go away. Uh -oh. Thank you, Dr. Wachtel. Um, I think uh, this is perfect. We have a um, half hour just to run through a lot of questions. Don, would you like to start and ask some of the questions from Q&A of the whole panel? And uh, everybody on the panel, you can turn on your video and uh, unmute yourselves. There you go. All right, Don, take it away. Hi, so I have two questions that I actually pushed to the side, so you might not be able to see them, but I promised the participants I'd ask. And the first question uh, was actually about Kennedy Krieger Institute and whether or not they still have a three-year wait list. Uh, for what? It depends for what. Um, for inpatient or outpatient. <laughs> I know. So, you know, one of the things that is very interesting is that, you know, even though we have a center for autism, I, I don't work there. I work in the psychiatric clinic and Dr. Wachtel works in the inpatient unit. So um, as you saw before, I have a consultation clinic and that is easier to get in, but it's, it's a consultation. It's a one-time visit. So you can go back to your current provider. And inpatient, so I mean, as everybody knows, these sources of resources are so like scarce across the United States. It, it really depends. I mean, the average wait list for the MBU probably does exceed a year. It's usually not three years. That would be more likely in the case of A, an adult, or B, um, somebody who has like a lot of medical issues, um, is using protective equipment. Um, or is um, big. So the our heavy sluggers, as I like to call them, do wait a longer time. So it's usually not three years, but the MBU is not like, a, it's not unfortunately an acute option. Thank you. And the second question that came up in the chat is about lorazepam. And uh, there were two questions. How long is it um, safe to be on? Uh, this medication, and then how would you recommend weaning off of the medication? It depends for what it is. If it's a catatonia indication, or if it is used for temporary sedation. Um, if it's used for temporary sedation, um, you know, one of the problems is that you will get, you know, the, the patient will get used to it, and then you're just chasing the dose. So I would hope that people can get, you know, a, taper off and discontinued, um, but you cannot do it alone. You have to do it absolutely with your physician, you know, hand by hand. And sometimes you can't, and if you can't, you can't, period. And if it's related to catatonia, that's a Dr. Wachtel question. Yeah, so, so benzodiazepines and catatonia, that's a very different like usage. And um, typically what you'll see is that catatonic patients respond to benzodiazepines in like a completely different way. So, um, you know, you, like, 
I've taken benzodiazepines before, like when my daughter had um, ear surgery, because I just couldn't tolerate the waiting and like they make you feel loopy, right? Um, but patients with catatonia, um, actually, they'll, they'll wake up, they'll start talking, they'll start interacting, they'll start eating, they'll move, they'll like, the catatonia goes away. And um, dosages for benzodiazepines and catatonia can be very high. We've had patients up to like six, seven or eight milligrams three times a day, which be would be enough for like, to put several of us in the emergency room if we were not catatonic. Um, and patients with catatonia who are actually lucky enough to respond to first line intervention with benzodiazepines and not need ECT um, could end up on benzodiazepines indefinitely. And you know that's really like benzos get like a bad rap and definitely where Carmen and I work, um, they do have a street value. And if they're teenagers at home who might wanna like sell them or like use them with their, their friends, that's not really great. But um, when those types of factors are mitigated, I mean, benzodiazepines can be used safely long-term and for some patients really are imperative. I find sometimes the dose keeps going up and up and that's hard because then when you try and come off, they have a real hard time coming off. So you need to go down slowly. And for some of the benzos, there's more seizure risk than others if you come down too fast. Uh, but I have some patients that uh, are maintained on one milligram twice a day for a long time. And some of the patients with catatonia are still on five or six milligrams a day. I've tried to drop them from 18 or 20 and take it down. Um, and, I, and it's hard to get below that, but I find that the six doesn't wear off uh, when they're on it and, and it's hard to get lower. Um, but I, I always try and fight not using it, but sometimes it is, yeah. It just helps. And, and it, I resist going up and up and up on the dose unless it's for catatonia. Yeah. And the, the one thing that I would recommend is avoid to use it as a PRN, especially if, if you're, you know, if your individual with autism is not at home, I, I don't like to trust necessarily on the judgment of other people that are not medical or the parents to administer these medications. Thank you. Our next Oop, I, frozen. Think, I think Don froze. Uh, sorry, Don, you might want to log out and log back in. I'm so sorry, you did freeze. Um, okay, so here's, uh, I'll, I'll go ahead and ask the next question. Um, if you're, uh, uh, re regarding risperidone and Abilify, how high is the likelihood it may cause movement disorder, such as um, akathisia or tardive dyskinesia, which can be an even bigger problem. Carmen? Any? Yeah, I, go ahead, okay. Dr. Andren. Go ahead. I, I think in my experience, it's been very, very rare, uh, much more rare than with the typical antipsychotics. Um, I watch for it though carefully. And if it starts, if I start to think there's the akathisia uh, is more common. And I find, especially with aripiprazole and risperidone and more- Can with, you explain what that is, akesthesia? It's a kind of inner restlessness of feeling like you're gonna jump out of your skin, often is accompanied with difficulty sleeping, can sometimes seem almost a little hypomanic or manic, um, but they just feel uncomfortable, you feel uncomfortable. And um, I found it more often with um, Latuda than with any of the others, but some with Abilify. And it's often dose related. And sometimes I can go down on the dose and that gets better. Sometimes I can go back up slowly later and it's okay. The, t the tardive dyskinesia, if I see something like that, I just work really fast to get off of the medication. We may oh. all have different answers, but that's mine. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I think, you know, we see it much more with the, the typical antipsychotics, the first generation ones that, you know, were in the second slide, all the prolixin, haloperidone, all of those. Um, but we do see more than tardive dyskinesia. We do see some extra pyramidal effects, you know, the tremors, you know, funky movements, and you do see that. And, and you know, those are not permanent, those are apparent immediately, and then you can decide what to do with the medication. Remember, everything is a risk-benefit conversation. 
So you have to be very well informed about the long term. Now, we have seen adults or, you know, actually young adults that have been on medications like this forever, and they do develop tardive dyskinesia. In the adult psychiatry world and neurology world and movement disorders world, there are now medications that are used to treat tardive dyskinesia. Those VMAT inhibitors, yep. yeah. And it's, I think it's also important to keep in mind, everybody worries with Risperidone about Risper, oh, weight gain, breast development in males and like the movement disorders. But as I'd mentioned in one of the earlier slides about like um, unusual side effects, we've learned that um, many of these kids often develop other problems like prolongation of their QTC or dropping their platelets, dropping their ANC. Like three out of 16 of my patients two weeks ago on the unit had um, developed or started to develop like suppression of their bone marrow from a bill so it's important to keep in mind like the range of side effects and um, we've found that our kids may really need further monitoring than would be typically advised for um, uh, for individuals taking those medications without ASD and intellectual disability. Great. Um, I think we, we lost Dawn for now. Stephen, would you like to ask some of the questions? If not, I can. Uh, you go ahead, Jill. Thank you. Okay, is ECT safe uh, to use and treat uh, self-injurious behavior with patients who also have seizure disorders? So that's a great, that's like a really good question. Um, and the answer is yes. Um, so having a seizure disorder is not a contraindication to um, ECT. And um, there are actually like very few contraindications to ECT. Probably the, some of those might include like having had like open heart surgery or like brain surgery in the last few days. And um, there are a number of individuals as um, some people might know, um, having epilepsy or a seizure disorder independent of autism or intellectual disability or any genetic syndrome actually predisposes you to um, additional psychopathology and um, which like historically was thought to not be the case um, and has a lot to do with the development initially of ECT as a biological therapy. But um, so there are a number of patients with seizure disorders um, who also have um, bipolar disorder or major depression and require um, ECT in order to remain healthy. And um, it has been found that those patients can be um, safely treated. Um, usually patients with a seizure disorder, um, it's a lot easier to um, elicit a therapeutic seizure during ECT with patients who are on either Depakote or Lamictal as compared to um, Tegretol. And I mean, it does require that those seizure medications um, are usually held the night before and the morning of ECT, because the issue if you have a seizure disorder and you're being treated for that with an anticonvulsant, the anticonvulsant in your system is also um, potentially going to make it harder to elicit a therapeutic seizure with ECT. So um, that's why you need to withhold the medication. Um, also like interesting thing to keep in mind in terms of like seizure disorders and ECT is that um, ECT in and of itself, each time that you receive ECT is going to like jack up your seizure threshold, which um, is partly why um, over the long term it may become more difficult and you have to have kind of more tricks up your sleeve to elicit a quality seizure. But um, the usage of ECT might actually provide um, some additional benefit in seizure control because it's going to increase that seizure threshold. And um, although it's actually, and so it's actually, ECT has actually been studied as a, um, a, a alternative method of managing intractable seizure disorders and found to not confer significant benefit. That being said, ECT is actually used in some third world countries, particularly like in India, um, as kind of an augment for um, patients who have intractable seizure disorders, so they don't necessarily have access to all of the kind of like new and fancy and very expensive anticonvulsants that we have here. The other thing to keep in mind with ECT is that there is a risk of having tardive or later seizures in, um, outside of ECT. And so we have seen some patients with um, e undergoing ECT who will develop um, more frequent seizure activity and might need to be treated for that outside of, outside of treatment, outside of ECT itself. There's a little follow-up um, question about this, and then I think I'll turn it back to, to Don and, and to Jennifer to ask more about pharmaceuticals. But with ECT, um, she's surprised there isn't more discussion about the frequent sedation because you have to be sedated. The patient has to be sedated before undergoing um, the treatment. What is the neurological risk of putting a patient under general anesthesia once a week for the course of their life to administer this treatment? 
Well, so right, so the patient does undergo anesthesia because um, in modern times, since like the 1980s, pretty much universally, ECT is done in what's known as modified ECT. So the patient is asleep and the patient is under neuromuscular blockade as compared to unmodified ECT, which was used like in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, where the the patient is is not asleep and there's no neuromuscular blockade. Um, so, you know, I guess like anesthesia has kind of this like scary, like kind of aura about it, but um, the risk of like anesthesia is really associated with like kind of your general physical health. And so anybody who receives anesthesia, you know, they're going to be evaluated in advance and anesthesia gives you like what's called an ASA score based on like your risks. So if you're like a, the average ECT patient might be like an elderly patient with multiple pro medical problems. But if you have congestive heart failure and you've had like heart attacks and you've had cancer and you've had you know x y and z your risk of complications from from anesthesia may be a lot higher than an asa1 who has no really like no increased risk of anesthesia and you're getting down to um, looking at the fact that uh, 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 like risk of anesthesia or dying from anesthesia and a healthy individual with anesthesia performed in like a modern medical facility is less than the risk of dying being hit by a car in the crosswalk and dying so um, I think that the the they're really the the risk of anesthesia itself is really very minimal for somebody who otherwise doesn't have medical issues that makes anesthesia complicated. So like I have a patient now who might be going to ECT who has like an a hole in her heart. Well, that's that's a that's a different issue that might jack up like her risk of complications, but that has to do with her the hole in her heart, not with and the issues with anesthesia and IV filtration for somebody like that. But again, you know, it always comes back to in terms of like unknowns and long terms, what Dr. Lopez pointed out in terms of like risks and benefits. And uh, usually when patients get to the point of considering ECT as a treatment option, the, um, the other choice is, is not very good. Great. Don, do you want to um, pick up some questions, uh, maybe going outside of ECT now? Sure, I'm. I can only see the new questions. When I logged back in, it lost all my early questions. So I can ask a, one of the recent ones, and maybe Jennifer can ask the older questions. Go ahead. Uh, we have a question about uh, echinacea and medicine that's used, and whether or not that it can activate or reactivate agitation and sleep disorders. Yeah. So oh, so um, about the the movement disorders. So are we talking about the tardive dyskinesia? I'm, I'm actually checking on the brand name. The brand name is called Ingressa and the, the, it's Valbenesine. I don't know if I'm pronouncing it correctly, uh, but that is the medication that is marketed for tardive dyskinesia uh, in adults. Um, and then about the benzodiazepines. Yes, some kids or even adults uh, will get activated or agitated on benzodiazepines. It happens. Um, if I take it, it might sedate me. If Dr. Rotel takes it, it might sedate her. If Dr. Hendry takes it, he may get agitation. It's totally, it can happen. It's it's listed on the on the side possible side effects. Now, when we're talking about the waking up, if you're catatonic, that's what benzodiazepines do, and that is a positive effect. So it, it, they're they're very different. I think they also referred to akesthesia and uh, asking about how to treat that. I, I think that's a tough one. Some people think that maybe propranolol can help with akesthesia. Uh, I find sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. I, I give it a try, but usually I try another medication that doesn't have akesthesia rather than trying to stay with that unless nothing else seems to work. Or if there are other opinions in our group. No, I agree. I think, you know, if you read the, the side effects of medications, they list everything under the sun. Does that mean it's going to happen to you? No. Is there a possibility that it might happen? Yeah. And, you know, one of the things that is very interesting about Akatisha is that it also happens with other medications. It not only happens with antipsychotics, it can happen with SSRI, like, you know, sertraline can give you Akatisha. Or you know, uh, metoclopramide, which is a medication that you know people use for for GI motility, can give you akatisha. 
other medications can too. The issue here is that, the, well, the difficulty that I see here is that sometimes people cannot tell you what it is and it will look to you like agitation. When, you know, when people can describe it, they say, you know, they feel that their skin is on fire. Like they really want to crawl out of it because they feel physically an, an effect on it and they cannot stand it. They start pacing and just try to scratch, but scratch it doesn't help. So I try to move away from medications that do that. It might, and a different one, the same category that it might have a Katisha listed as a side effect might not give it. So it's, you just have to try a different one. Thank you. We also have a question from a parent about uh, triazolam in a severely affected nonverbal teen with OCD, other comorbidities, Tourette's. Um, I guess they're just asking if. Yeah. If so in my personal opinion, and because, you know, people do all kinds of different things, I, I do not go with benzodiazepine for first line of treatment for OCD. I don't know if you guys have any other opinions, but yeah, that's not first line. Which doesn't mean that, you know, it is what it is. Like I said before, um, people don't come with manuals. There's no instructions and we are all different individuals. And it is important to not judge personal cho choices. I don't live with your child, you do, right? So I think it's important as clinicians to evaluate the data, have a conversations, discuss risks and benefits, what are the options, read the literature of what is uh, backed by research, but the reality, and you know, one of the comments was talking about how there's not much research about many of our patients. And the reality is that it is very difficult to have uh, research in people with intellectual disabilities or, or different things because of IRB protocols, which it's understandable, it's for their own protection. But at the same time, if you see many of the research studies of anything that you wanna pick, it's usually one thing. They don't, they don't usually include people with multiple things uh, in, in one person. So it makes it very difficult and you have to extrapolate the data and meet the needs of the individual that it's in front of you. There's no recipe for that. I see an earlier question here from Megan. Um, that uh, <clears throat> have you seen emotional lability, more crying typically with alpha agonists? Have you seen issues with returning to baseline after stopping long acting alpha agonists? Yep, sometimes it happens with wanfacin. So you stop it and you move on to something else. Dr. Hendren or Dr. Wachtel? I mean, I wouldn't say that I have, a, I have seen that very frequently. Um, I guess it's sort of, you know, anything can happen though. And so it was certainly, if, if that does happen to somebody, then yeah, I would agree. Like, okay, maybe that's not what we were expecting, but this is what we're experiencing. So time to look at something different. And it's been rare in my experience, but I have seen some people that get tearful or crying or seeming even depressed on either the, either of the two alpha agonists. Um, and I do find return to baseline, you know, to where they were before. It, it was being helpful. It doesn't cure anything. It's just treating the uh, alpha re uh, receptor. And, and so when you stop, then that stops. Yeah. I mean, alpha agonists can actually be like really nice because sometimes they can kind of help you with the toning you down or sort of like lengthening your fuse, providing a little bit more like ego glue. And um, usually the side effects of alpha agonists in terms of like sedation or being tired or potentially we we're talking about now with the affective changes are a lot lesser than like side effects from antipsychotics, for example. So um, it can be like a really good option for just sort of eh, bringing somebody down like a couple of notches. Yeah. I'm going to go ahead and um, inject a couple more questions. Um, we've had a couple of questions about lithium and about long-term risks of, of using lithium. If you could talk about that and also a related question about getting blood work on some of these patients. Um, it's really, really hard to do if you have 
recommendations. Um, you have a, a son like mine, it's very hard to even bring him in for an appointment. What recommendations do you have about getting the blood work? I can answer. Oh, go ahead. I'll go, I'll go later. Oh, so, I, I, so just to speak about lithium, so I actually like love lithium. I think it's like a great agent. It's been significantly helpful for many of our patients. Sometimes I think we should like put it in the water on the unit. Um, I think that, you know, lithium is particularly for like mood stabilization and um, also for very severe aggression can be like a true like lifesaver. Um, lithium does require monitoring both acute and long term. And, um, you know, there's risks associated with potential lithium toxicity, particularly related to um, hydration status. There are problems with lithium in terms of making people very thirsty or having them pee all the time or developing urinary incontinence, which can be really hard to swallow after you've worked for years to gain that in your child. But um, for mood stabilization and, and also for most of our maintenance ECT patients end up on lithium, um, it is like, can be like a lifesaver. Long-term monitoring of lithium is important. And um, so actually, if you're on lithium, you've pretty much bought yourself like quarterly lab work in terms of looking at your kidney function, your serum lithium level, and your thyroid. And over time, it's true, probably the biggest risk of lithium is it, can there be any type of kidney damage? Now, I've been doing this for 18 years, so I'm just now getting to the point of having patients for, that I've known for this longer, longer period of time. Um, you know, as compared to being in training and just seeing people have hazardly, I've had that happen to one patient who did develop um, changes in renal function tests, and then he was sent to nephrology and found to have some kidney damage and had to come off of lithium. I mean, it can happen, and after like a decade of usage, that that is very much like a a real risk, and that's documented in like the in the adult literature. But on the other hand, lithium can really be an incredible agent. Um, it just requires a lot of monitoring and it requires a lot of care because of potential also for acute toxicity. What about that follow-up question, Dr. Wachtel, about you know these difficult patients, it's hard to get blood work from them. Um, what, what do you do at Kennedy Krieger to, to help families get their kids' blood work done? Yeah, I mean, blood work is like a huge problem. Many of our kids like require like a SWAT team to help with getting blood. So, I mean, on the inpatient floor, our, you know, our nursing staff actually has a lot of experience with that and we're able to use the behavioral teams that are working with the kids. Um, and it's usually not a big issue on the inpatient floor, although some kids will need to use like a, a papoose or there's another thing called like the big hug. It's like softer than a papoose, but has all these kind of straps. So you could sort of make somebody like a mummy, but just have like one arm out so you could draw blood. Um, I know that Kennedy and outpatient also, they will, they do have a clinic where you're able to do blood draws, um, taking advantage of having people here who um, have experience working with this patient population and would be in a better position to facilitate the blood draws compared to just have, sending somebody to like Quest or LabCorp where they're expecting like somebody like you or me to, to come up who's going to, going to cooperate. Um, we have also had patients where we have desensitized them to um, blood draws. Um, I've had a behaviorist working on that. Um, sometimes we'll do things with patients if it is like a question of like the pain and the needle stick using like either the um, Emla cream or there's like a spray. Um, you know, there are a lot of things that you can pursue, but it can be like a big challenge. And a lot of times it like boils down to having appropriate staffing so that the child could be managed and the blood can be drawn and, um, people don't get hurt. Dr. Hendren, were you going to um, speak I to this? I agree with everything that Dr. Wachtel had to say about lithium. I, I think it works well. It's good. I watch for kidney and, uh, and thyroid, uh, but it does well. For the blood draws, um, I, you know, you try and uh, see if there can't be a time when they're going for a dental procedure or they're having something else done and you can try and get the blood draws then and you make sure parents are aware of that if anything happens, even if the kid needs to go to the emergency room and then for some reason is they're gonna get the blood, be sure and get it for me too, I try and let them know. And so I think looking for those opportunities. The one where I found it challenging is sometimes when I'm just putting somebody on a medication and I'm starting at the beginning and they don't wanna get their blood draws and do I think, well then do I not do it? 
or do I traumatize them by having a bunch of big men lay on them and and get their blood? Um, and I'll sometimes titrate up to an area where I feel okay, hoping that they start doing better before I get the blood draw. So like if it's uh, valproic acid, I might go up to a thousand milligrams and, uh, and watch for toxicity or on lithium, I might go up to 1200 and, uh, and then hope they're doing well enough that I can get a blood draw or if they're doing better and they don't show signs of toxicity. I think that's being a little cavalier. A lot of people wouldn't do it, but when I'm faced with the option of just not being able to put them on the medication and I've tried other things like other antipsychotics, then I sometimes go there. Um, so I have a couple of things about this. So I spoke not greatly about benzodiazepines, but this is one that I'm on it. You know, I think lorazepam is great. I use it all the times for blood draws, you know, give it to them before they go. And then if you need it to do it again when they're there, because otherwise, you know, with the big guys, we cannot do it. You know, it's, it's not possible. So we do use benzodiazepines for those things. And then the second thing that somebody also put in the chat and it's very true, there are some services that will go to your home to get the blood draw. However, the tricky part there is that if you can afford it, that's great. But you know, they'll, the blood will be processed by the lab and your insurance, but the drop per se, it's a service that doesn't necessarily cover by the insurance company. So it is out there and you know, we advise some of our families to use it if they can and if they want to do it. Somebody also asked in the chat about um, lithium orotate. I think it's important to point out the difference between lithium orotate as more of like a nutritional supplement and lithium carbonate, um, uh, which is lithium and like a, a, as a as a true psychotropic. So lithium is a medication actually that needs to be titrated up um, to a certain serum level, and lithium really works for targeting like a bipolar mood disorders, aggression. Once you hit a certain serum level, that's usually between like zero eight and one point one milliequivalents per liter. So more of these like microscopic dosages as a nutritional supplement in like lithium orotate that you could buy at like GNC or off of the internet. Um, those really wouldn't be expected to confer the same benefit as lithium carbonate, which is a medication that you need a prescription for. Great. Thank you. Uh, Don, Jennifer, or Stephen, we have four more minutes. So if you see questions you would like to pitch, please do so now. Uh, yes, I have one. Uh, it's nice to see people from all over the world. Uh, this is a doctor from Argentina. I would like to know if you have some experience or knowledge about long-term treatment with CBD on SNC or some addiction. I'm not quite sure what that is. What's SNC? I'm not sure. I don't um, know. Um, then, um, but it seems it must be related to addiction. Right. I don't, I, I've not been aware of there being any problem with addiction. I, if people that are um, neurotypical are using a lot of marijuana, there are some side effects that seem to happen long term. Like, the doctor, one of the doctors said something if you're doing neurosurgery the next day, maybe you wouldn't recommend that they uh, are using that. But I guess you think through the trade offs. I have found that people who use it for a long time tend to be, uh, to have a little more difficulty with concentration and focus. I just, for the kids that I'm using it for, I don't know that anybody notices that difference. Here, another one is, uh, how ris risky is Lamictal? Our no neurologist wanted to try it, but the black box label scares us. You know, all antidepressants and anxiety medications and all the anti-epileptics have the black box warning. Um, and uh, also Stratera, the atomoxetine, has the black box warning. Trastaron has the black box warning. So uh, Lamotrigine is for the risk of Stevens Johnson's. I, I have, you know, which is a very severe rash. I've been doing this only, only for 14 years and I've never seen one. Um, do I use Lamotrigine when I have to? Yes. Uh, I don't know your opinion, uh, Lee Robert. I think the um, neurologists are comfortable titrating up slowly, going 25 milligrams every week or two weeks and 
they they feel casual about it. But I think for those of us that were around when it first came out and they told us never use this with children, they can die. I, I think we all feel cautious at that point, but I use it occasionally. It's not my first line, but I, I titrate up slowly and I titrate down slowly. Yeah, I mean, there's a problem with Lamictal that if you could develop, like, I think they say, even though a smaller portion of patients actually develop Stevens Johnson syndrome, like 10% of patients will have a rash. And so any type of rash and you're done. But, um, you know, you have to keep in mind, like lots of other things like Depakote, Tegretol can be associated with Stevens Johnson's. And I've actually not seen Stevens Johnson's syndrome on Lamictal, but I have seen it on Tegretol. I've had one patient on Lamictal who developed it, but the person titrated up too fast. It wasn't my patient. Um, and she spent months in the hospital. She recovered, but she continues to have liver function problems. And it still makes me cautious about those people. Well, I hate to um, bring this to a close because we have so many questions that we don't have time to answer. I'm almost tempted to um, do a, a follow-up event that is solely devoted to like open forum, right? With um, the, the psychiatrists, because I think there are so many questions, but regrettably we have to bring this to a close. I really want to thank our hosts today, Jennifer, Stephen, and Don. And I especially want to thank our speakers, Dr. Hendren, Dr. Wachtel, and Dr. Lopez. Um, thank you very much. Uh, we will post a recording of this on our website later today, and you'll get an email about that. Um, so thank you so much. Sorry to bring this wonderful um, event to a close. Thank you for having us, Jill. Thank you. Bye-bye. Nice Bye-bye.